Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dallas. You know, there are some songs that just, right? They just get you. So it's Ask the Minister Sunday. <laughs> and so questions were submitted to me, and we're going to try and answer them. How does that sound to everybody? So the first question, how do I talk about unity and unity principles to people who don't know about unity? Something easy to share, the three-minute elevator speech. Anyone in here struggle with that? So what, what just happened in here is actually what comes to me as to how I would describe unity, that it's a, it's a community. It's a sacred community. It's a... It's a group of people who have come together and said yes to seeing the best and the brightest about each other. It's a group of people that have come together to anchor love and to grow, to grow individually and collectively. And I would say too that it's a movement that is about healing on the deepest level possible, the deepest level possible. And that it's an opportunity to be able to show up. You know, unity is unique because we have these three foundational principles, that there is one power and one presence. And that if there truly is only one power and one presence, then we can't be separate from that power and that presence. So our second principle is that I am that power and that presence. I am divine. I am not broken. How many people in this world have been told by the world that you're broken? Unity does not believe that we are broken. Unity believes that we are whole. And that because we are divine, that we get to create. That we are creative beings. And that we get to choose what it is that we're going to create. And what unity is anchored in is that we are creating more love, always more love, always looking for ways. So we offer practical, useful tools for living a more fulfilled and loving life. And we're open to anyone from any background. You can bring wherever you've come from, you can bring it here, and we've got room for it all. That's something that's very unique about unity that you don't have to give up whatever identity you might have from your birth tradition, perhaps, or from not having any tradition, perhaps, and you will have a space here. It's a place to connect with love. That would, right now, today, that's my three-minute elevator speech, <laughs> right? It does change all the time. Um, so many things sort of pinging through my head as I was talking about that, right? What does it really mean to be divine? What does that ask of us? What are we each invited to become? That would be another thing that I might say about unity is that we live in the question. That we don't think that we're done. We're living into the question of what does it really mean to show up as our most authentic most connected, most inclusive self. Those are our core values, right? How do, we, how do we actually do that? And I don't have all the answers, do you? But look around, right? Together, we have incredible wisdom that's available to us. Incredible, incredible wisdom. So the second question I have is, is unity Christian? And if not, what would it be called? <laughs> It'd be called a lot of things, I think, actually. Uh, this, question is, this question comes up within unity about every 20 years or so. It sort of moves its way through the movement. And there are two distinct camps within unity. There are those who definitely do 
say that unity is Christian. And then there is the other camp, which is the universalists, that unity is universal and that it's not specifically Christian. I think for wherever you are personally, it's whatever you, wherever you are personally. If it resonates for you as a Christian method, message, as a Christian movement, woohoo, go for it. We do absolutely anchor ourselves in the teachings of Jesus. And yet, we're anchoring ourselves in the teaching of Jesus before something like Christianity even existed. We, we are anchoring ourselves in the teachings of Jesus from before the whole system got created around Jesus. Does that make sense? So does that make us Christian? There are some people that say, yes, because we're founded on the teachings of Jesus, that means we're Christian. I personally struggle with that because to say that we're Christian comes with a whole lot of other things, comes with a whole lot of other beliefs that are that go along with what it means to be Christian. The biggest one is that we are saved through the sacrifice of Jesus and his suffering. That is not what unity believes. Like, take a breath with me. That is not what unity believes. Unity believes that we are whole. We may not know it. We, not, we may not know how to live into it. But it's what we actually are already. So there's no outside deity that we are praying to. We are actually invited to understand God, not as a being, but as, a, as beingness. So for me, that also distinguishes us from Christianity. If someone is coming here... Today is bring a friend to Unity in Marin today, yes? So if somebody new is showing up here and they're expecting a Christian experience, do you think that those needs are going to be met here at Unity in Marin? Maybe, right? Can you feel it? It's like, yeah, maybe, mm, I don't know. So... I'm going to share something. This is really moving through the community right now. And it is bringing up a lot of stuff for a lot of people. So Jim uh, Blake, who is the CEO of Unity Worldwide Headquarters, um, released this video, which he sent out to ministers and spiritual leaders. So it's the way he's talking about it is to ministers and spiritual leaders. You can find this on Unity's website. It's on their YouTube page. This is not private that I'm sharing something. But just so you have the context on how he's languaging it, um, what I love about this too is it'll give you an opportunity to really see the village. And Unity Village is just incredible. And if you have never been, uh, Linda Martelowitz and I have been invited to do a a, an in-depth prayer retreat at the village in 2025. So mark your calendars. Um, so can we show this? Greetings, friends. Jim Blake here. Many of you have been asking me an important question lately regarding the direction of unity. Today, I would like to try to answer that question. It has to do with Christianity and whether unity should identify itself as a Christian denomination. The way we present ourselves to the world is important. Some of you may remember the major rebranding effort in 2009 and 2010 when UWH and UWM worked together to craft the exact language we wanted to use to describe unity, along with designing a new website and a new logo. We decided at the time that while we will never forget our Christian roots, we would not brand ourselves as primarily Christian. As a result, our tagline became a positive path for spiritual living. This approach has been working well for us at UWH. We aim to include the broader spiritual community, which may or may not be religious or part of any church. We try to create a big tent like many of you do in your own ministries. And like you, we often hear from people who are grateful to be accepted wherever they are on their spiritual path. It is not our intention to give anyone the impression that they have to be Christian to be in unity. 
Keeping our language more general has resulted in sustained growth for UWH in recent years. More people are subscribing to our emails and following us on social media. More people are visiting our website to find spiritual resources. Of course, many of them, Christians and non-Christians, subscribe to Daily Word and use Unity to enhance and expand their traditional beliefs, just as the film wars intended. As people become more familiar with Unity, they will hear us teaching from the Bible and dwelling on the life and teachings of Jesus. People within Unity have a wide range of beliefs, and you know this. You probably have people in your ministries ranging from those who praise the Lord to those who shudder when they hear the word God. We love and accept them all, wherever they are. It's important to note that the Christian landscape has changed since the film wars were alive. But we know people of all persuasions are looking for their spiritual support for themselves or their loved ones. They appreciate an uplifting message from David Word, a prayer with silent unity, an inspirational booklet or unity materials about healing, forgiveness, or guidance. So with that in mind, that's what we at UWH will continue to provide. Our mission at UWH is to help and serve more people through prayer, publishing, and community. We don't exclude Christianity, neither do we believe that a Christian label would attract more people. We believe we need a wide open door to help and serve more and more people. We use language that lets them know they are not required to believe any particular religious doctrine in order to belong here. Unity's founders embraced universal spiritual teachings that show up in every major religion. These teachings have helped to elevate human consciousness for thousands of years. They provide us a positive path for spiritual living, whether you call it Christ consciousness, the Buddha nature, or simply transformation. To us, that's unity, and that's the unity we at UWH want to share with the world. I hope that helps to answer some of your questions. Blessings to each of you for the work you are doing in the world. Namaste. Do you see the campus? Isn't that beautiful, Unity Village? And they just put that giant labyrinth in. Yeah, I can't wait to walk it. So as you can see, this is a question that's unfolding within Unity itself. Right? It's, it's a question that we just keep coming back to again and again. Our roots are Judeo-Christian. Absolutely. We are grounded in Scripture that is Judeo-Christian. But we are not literal in how we interpret that Scripture. So that's another distinction from a lot of Christian philosophy. We are metaphysical. We are metaphysical in our approach to how we navigate Scripture. And I personally know that there's great wisdom teachings in all the major faith traditions. So I would say that we operate on the mystical level that is that universal place where all these major faith traditions actually are sourced from. And then from that, you get specific rituals and beliefs and all those kinds of things that are different, but we're all pointing to the same thing. Does that make sense? Right? So it's complicated. <laughs> but, you know, unity is, uh, it, unity's belief system is something that is actually, like, deep. It's, there's a deepness to it. It doesn't just operate on a surface level. It really is inviting us all the time to examine and go deeper. So if, Christi if a Christian identity is important to you, hold it tight. Keep hold of it. It fits. It works. But if a non-Christian identity is important to you, if it lives in you, then absolutely keep it, because it works. I have a friend who's an atheist, and he said to me once, everybody assumes that what they think I believe God to be, because I say I'm a minister, and they immediately think I, I believe God is a being. And so this atheist has said, well, we don't have anything in common. And I said, are you sure about that? And he said, well, yeah, because I don't believe in God. And I said, well, I probably don't believe in the God that you don't believe in either. 
And they sort of looked at me. <laughs> and they were like, well, God sits on a throne. And I was like, eh, I don't believe in that. But God has judgment. No, I don't believe in that either. So we all get to decide how we want to name that. But honestly, we have a lot in common with atheists. Take a deep breath. We do. <laughs> we do in how we understand because we understand it as a beingness, not being. So the next question, you heard Jim speaking a lot about the big tent. And the next question asks, the spiritually inclusive big tent of unity teachings and principles has always been a draw for me, and I'm sure for many others in our community. How do we most effectively hold differing orientations and preferences for spiritual practice in our big tent without making people uncomfortable? It's a great question. One of our core values is inclusivity. How do we create a space if we are a big tent? How do we create that space? My first, and my first thought when I read that question was, well, is it so wrong to be uncomfortable? Part of inclusivity is about expanding our understanding of the world. And that means that when we're a big tent and we've got all these different opinions and perspectives and preferences and priorities and desires and wants, and they all come together, are they going to collide? Yeah. Isn't that great? I mean, really, though, and I'm not just saying that. Isn't that great? Because that's how we grow. That's how we evolve, is by having someone challenge an assumption that we might have had about ourselves or about the world. And so, yeah, it might make us a little uncomfortable at times. That being said, you absolutely need to take care of yourselves. Can everybody hear that too? That you need to take care of yourself. You need to make sure that your needs are being met. Whatever that might look like for you. I know there's a whole bunch of people watching from home because they are getting their needs met right now. They aren't necessarily very into the being in the space with a lot of other people energy. Are they welcome in our community? Yes. Absolutely, you're welcome in our community. This is what it means to be inclusive, that we create as many opportunities as possible for as much of the differences that exist out there. We have contemplative opportunities. We have upbeat opportunities. We have opportunities for people to be able to step in and meet their needs. And it's all grounded in what unity believes. I want to be really clear. Unity has a belief structure. One power, one presence. We are that power and that presence. We are creative. That is what we ground everything in. So yes, we are open at the top, but everything is held within the context of unity principle, of unity ideals. The idea, the divine idea that we hold in unity, that we are all here to be and to show up as our most authentic, most blazing self. And that we get to come together and create space for that, for each other. Is everybody's needs going to be met every single moment? No. But isn't that part of how we also learn how to grow? How we learn how to step in? And I will say this. I've had people come to me and say, you know, I really want this to happen here at Unity. I'm like, all yours. Make it happen. If there is a call from within this community for something, there is space to make it happen. Does everybody hear me on that? Right? That's what, we, that's what we come together as. We come together to make that sort of energy. We're creating something. We're creators, yes? So we're creating something together, something that has never existed before. And we get to bring that again and again in that Again, coming back to that space of love, coming back to that space of compassion. Uh, what is your view on artificial intelligence? <laughs> and how the unity movement should embrace it? 
I have heard it described as equivalent to radio at the time of the film wars. I personally would say, yes, I agree. Does that mean that AI doesn't have challenges? It does. I personally firmly believe that Unity should be on the forefront of navigating those challenges. Not trying to pretend that AI doesn't exist, not trying to condemn it or say, oh, it's a horrible thing, avoid it, don't pay attention to it. I was just watching Julia um, from, from Max, the, the thing with Julia Child, and she is about to create a television show and they didn't even own a TV because they didn't believe in television. They thought it was a fad. They thought it was something that wasn't gonna stick around. AI is not going anywhere, right? So we can either put our heads in the sand about it, or we can decide that we are going to be a movement that wrestles with the very real challenges of something like AI. That we, as a community, provide a moral compass. That's what we do in spiritual communities. We provide a moral compass. And that is so important that our voice be heard. Now, Jim, who you just saw, is very much on board with AI. So Unity uh, World Headquarters, so they run Silent Unity. And they have thousands of prayers that have been collected over the 140 years that Unity has existed. We're a baby, remember that too. We're a baby organization, movement. So um, they are using AI to actually access all of those prayers so that when somebody reaches out and says, I need a prayer, because you can access Silent Unity through their app, through email, right? That a prayer will instantly be created from the consciousness of the prayer field. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. So there are great gifts in AI. And we absolutely, I believe we need to be at the forefront of saying, this is how we use this responsibly. This is how we step into this from a place of consciousness. So, all right, here we go. You guys ready? Take a breath with me here. I continue considering how best to dismantle the notion of a God out there. As my prayers have increased with both quantity and quality through being a prayer chaplain and studying and implementing our Unity Affirmative Prayer Model, I still find myself opening up my arms at the conclusion and looking skyward to God. How do I acknowledge the divinity in my heart as well as accommodate my natural physical sense of an outwardly divine expression? Anybody in here relate? Hmm. And the, there was another question, which is, can you speak to the difference about God inside and God outside um, as it does or doesn't relate to there is no spot where God is not? So Unity has a catchphrase, there is no spot where God is not, all these cute things that rhyme, right? And what it's trying to say is there's only one power and one presence. Can you feel that? There is only one power and one presence, and there is no separation. You are not the exception. Because we all think we're the exception. You are not the exception. One power, one presence. You are it. You are creative. You have available to you all that that one power and one presence is. Now, not all at once, or you would explode. But you have available to you the capacity to be able to access qualities of the divine, to anchor yourself in faith, in love, in life, in power, in joy. You have that ability. So God outside, God inside, does it really exist? If there's only one, then there is no God outside and God inside. There is only that beingness. Our little brains start to short circuit, right? So this is why in our anchored human dual consciousness duality, we create a God inside and we create a God outside. We use it as a shortcut for languaging something. We use it as a way to try to understand the difference between what that I am awareness of the divine is, 
as opposed to the awe that we experience as we look at a star-filled sky. Are they exactly the same? We experience them differently, perhaps, but they are exactly the same. Yeah. Oh. And we get caught up in the God outside and the God inside just because in a lot of ways, so much of our, what Unity would call our embedded theology, what we all grew up with, what we sort of absorbed in the world around us, was about a God out there, a God who sat on a throne, a God who, you know, could get really angry at you, a God who could, you know, make you suffer just because, you know, just because, I want to test you. And that is not the kind of God that unity believes in. Now, for me, I found that to be very reassuring, and it was like, oh, phew, there's no trickster God. There's no God that's trying to pull the rug out under my feet the minute I feel like I found my center. There's nothing out there that's trying to trick me into having a negative experience. Do negative experiences happen? Yes. But that's not because there's some being up there messing with my life. Can you feel the difference? So as you're in your practice around moving perhaps from, from a more integrated awareness, it, for me it's always about integration. Unity's teachings to me, I say, they're additive and inclusive. Additive and inclusive. So whatever relationship you might have had with the God out there, you don't have to lose that sense of relationship but it's going to look different if you're also acknowledging the God right here. It's going to feel different. Now, for me, the God outside is each one of you. That is who I understand God outside to be, each one of you. Not some being up in the sky, but the divinity that each one of you is that in time and in space perhaps feels separate from me, but in truth is not. And when we talk about this, our brains want to categorize it and make sense of it, and guess what? You can't. Because we're talking about a divine paradox. We're talking about something that is untalkable about. <laughs> what would I, it's, you, you cannot language it. You cannot. And that's why most of the great mystic traditions have some sort of practice that is experiential, that is just about the beingness of it. Now, in unity, we would call ours the silence, where you experience the I am. For the, for the, for the dervishes, it's the twirling, right? To give them an experience of something, of the wholeness that we each are. So yeah, there is no spot where God is not. But can you hear how even in that expression, which is cute and pithy and it helps, but can you hear how it implies that I believe that there's a spot where God is not? We want to try to uh, just get rid of it altogether. It's not true. It's not a true belief. And this is what unity is really all about to me, is about healing. Healing the false beliefs that I'm separate. Healing the false belief that I'm not enough. Healing the false belief that somehow I'm broken, that somehow the world is broken. I don't know how people move through this world when they believe that it is broken. I don't know how they get up every day because I know the thing that gets me out of bed every day is the fact that I know the innate wholeness of this world that is seeking to reveal itself. And that it does that through me, and it does that through each of you, that that is the power of unity's teachings. <laughs> we can applaud that, right? <laughs> so this next question comes right on the heels of this. Okay, <laughs> they wrote, okay. Okay, what is hatred? I understand from unity principles that love has no opposite. But in common talk, people often say, I hate, fill in the blank, something big or something inconsequential. Is hate an emotion? 
I have heard that anger is not a fundamental emotion, but arises from more basic feelings. Is hate similar? The question arises as we hear on the news that people are tearing down Israeli hostage posters or Israelis. So there's a lot going on in the world right now, yes? And that hate, the thing about hate, so what, how unity understands this, okay, this is the unity cosmology, is that love is the strongest power in the world, in everything, in, beyond the world. Love is the basis of all that there is. And how unity understands love is not the touchy-feely, emotional understanding of love. How unity understands love as a divine concept of the absolute is that it is the harmonizing energetic between and through and as everything. It is the harmonizer. So can you feel how hatred is really love not being accessed in a way that is truth? We all have access to our powers, as we call them in unity, right? And I did a whole series on the 12 powers, so if you're interested in knowing more about them, you can look it up online. We, they're, they're there on our YouTube channel. But we all have those powers of love, faith, life, zeal, right? Will, wisdom, they are all ours. How are you going to use them? Now, if you take your power of love, which is the attractor, it's the harmonizer, and you are focused on your own small human consequence, it very easily becomes hatred. Can you feel that? Can you feel how when all you're worried about is your own self, small self, that what you then see are th people or things or th situations that are trying to take something away from you. And what you attract and harmonize with are people who believe the exact same thing as you. And that spirals. And unfortunately, when we get in that kind of polarity, we are in that polarity. And it's really hard to pull ourselves out of that polarity because we fall into the story. Anybody here fall into the story? They did this to me, they did that to me, they took this from me. If only they hadn't. There are no easy solutions. But I do know this, that love is the only way that we can heal what's happening on this planet right now. It is the only way the ability, the willingness to step up in love. And I found this quote from Charles Fillmore. The love current is not a projection of the will. It is a setting free of a natural equalizing, harmonizing force that in most persons has been dammed up by human limitations. He goes on to say, always remember that love is of itself neither good or evil. These are qualities given to it by the think thinking faculty. To focus your love about self and selfish aims will cause it to draw around you the limited things of personality and the hollow sham of a sense life. How are you using your love? How are you focusing your ability to harmonize? What are you harmonizing with? This is where we get to choose. So hate absolutely exists in this realm of time and in space. But hate is not an absolute. Hate changes, right? How many people in here have experienced hate and then watched it shift and change and become something else? Sometimes it gets worse, sometimes it gets better. When we're talking about qualities of the absolute, they're immutable. They don't ever change. They're immutable. And that's what we're continually being invited to rest in. The thing that is a constant. And to remind ourselves that no matter what is arising in time and in space, that constant is more powerful. And we have seen the power of love 
I shared before I left about South Africa and Nelson Mandela. We look at Martin Luther King. We, there are examples that we can lean into, Mahatma Gandhi, of where love actually transformed the world. That is what we are being invited into with unity. That's the invitation. So we have time for one last question. How do we entice people to come in person in the brave new world of more and more online offerings from every teacher, leader, organization? So I would say, look around, right? There is something about coming together in time and in space that has a different texture, has a different energetic to it. And remember, we're inclusive. So there are those people who are watching at home. Some of them would love nothing more than to be here in person. But how amazing is it that they get to be a part of our community even if they can't be here in person? And then there are the people who quite honestly don't really want to be around people. I live with one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> she's, not, she's not even up there right now. She's helping in the kitchen, getting food heated up. Because she's like, oh, an opportunity to not be around people. <laughs> and that's okay. Yes? Can we make space for the people who don't necessarily want to be around people? And I, again, habits. You know, sometimes it's just habit that we're watching from home. Sometimes it's just, it's not so much about this is what actually meets my need and I'm taking care of myself, but it's actually, this is just easier. This is just simpler. And in those cases, I would say, come. Come in person. Crawl out of bed. Get that cup of coffee in your system as soon as possible and come into this space. Because this is a space where we get to sing, you've got a friend and it's fun. Who wouldn't want to be in that space, right? Um, it is bring a friend to unity. How many people actually brought friends with them to unity today? Oh, thank you to the one hand that went up. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. We're not gonna put anybody on the spot, I promise. But Hello. There used to be a saying that unity was the best kept secret. That's horrifying. Why are we a secret? Why would we want to be a secret? Why wouldn't we want to share these incredible teachings, these incredible musicians, this incredible, like, look at the decor that we have going on here, the gifts that people bring to this community. Why wouldn't we want to share that? So I just invite everybody to just take a look at that place where you didn't think you could invite somebody and just ask yourself, what is that about? What is that about? Because if, we're, if those of us who are in this teaching aren't willing to share this teaching, then we do have a problem, yes? We have to be willing to talk about the place where we feel whole where we get seen, where it's about community and connection. We have to be willing to step into that space. Now, is that uncomfortable for some of us? Yes, absolutely. Because this is a sacred space, yes? This is a tender space. This is, this is a, a, a vulnerable space. But those are the things that we share that are the most worthwhile. Can you feel the truth in that? The things that really just touch our hearts. Reach out. Share the things that touch your heart. Bring a friend. To, we've got an entire incredible holiday programming coming up. So invite somebody to come. And to come on a Sunday. And to experience and see what it's like. And if it's not for them, is that okay? Yeah, of course. Of course it is. Are we for everybody? Are we going to meet everybody's needs? 
No. We, un- we stick to what we know. We stick to what we believe, which is one power, one presence. Everybody say it with me. I am that power and presence. I am creative. So we have our affirmation, which is, I am living transformation and each new choice reveals more of my divine nature. Can we know this together? I am living transformation and each new choice reveals more of my divine nature. And so it is. Amen.